So I'm going to give you, probably maybe this should have come first because this is going to be kind of an aerial view of what all this is about. And uh, But I'll start by addressing the elephant in the room. Isn't this simply a conspiracy theory concocted by right-wing extremists like us? According to the New York Times and the Anti-Defamation League, the Great Reset has no basis in fact. Or as the BBC claims, the Great Reset is a benign effort on the part of uh, leading thinkers to bring about a fairer, greener future based on a reset of capitalism. Meanwhile, Time Magazine devoted an entire issue to the Great Reset, effectively hailing it as the solution to all our problems uh, post-COVID. Now, Klaus Schwab, the founder and chair, uh, executive chairman of the World Economic Forum, which is the WEF, suggests that the Great Reset is merely an attempt to address the weaknesses of capitalism exposed by the COVID crisis, as well as the looming catastrophes posed by unmitigated climate change and environmental degradation. I don't mean to suggest that there's some sort of median point between conspiracy theory and denial, actually. I just want to make clear what this Great Reset is. And uh, to, uh, to ferret out from the, imp you know, the implications from what these people actually say. Uh, but on the note of conspiracy theory, I believe that the WEF and uh, its partners actually generate conspiracy theories on purpose in order to discredit all, discredit all of the um, uh, critics of this project in advance. It's a preemptive move, like Klaus Schwab says at his last annual meeting, what we have on the agenda is another virus. And we go, what? And we, the future is not just happening. The future is made by you here in this room. Okay. Uh, I, I should have told you I would, I would do a few Klaus Schwab imitations. <laughs> But a brief history of the Great Reset tells us that there was a book published in 2010 uh, called The Great Reset by a guy named Richard Florida, but it had nothing to do with Schwab's Great Reset. He picked up the idea and uh, he ran with it. And, and then in 2014, uh, Schwab declared, what we want to do in Davos this year is to push the reset button. By this, he referred to an imaginary reset button on the global economic system of neoliberal capitalism. And that's the uh, weasel word that they use, neoliberalism, to describe what we would call free enterprise. Uh, a graphic depiction of the reset button appeared shortly thereafter. And then very strange things began to happen. There were two uh, uh, simulations that ran uh, previous to COVID-19 taking place. One of them uh, was called Clade X. It was uh, organized by Johns Hopkins University and uh, the World Economic Forum, and it simulated the uh, breakout of a novel uh, parainfluenza virus. Uh, this, uh, according to Homeland Preparedness News, the Clade X simulation demonstrated, quote, that the lack of a, both a protective vaccine and a proactive worldwide plan for tackling the spread of a catastrophic global pandemic resulted in the death of 150 million people across the earth, end quote. This is in 2018. Clearly, preparation for a global pandemic was in order. Then, a little after a year later, on October, in October 2019, the WEF's uncanny prescience was again on display, only this time with greater precision. Along with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the WF teamed up with the John Hopkins University again to stage another pandemic exercise called Event 201. Event 201 simulated the international response to the outbreak of a novel coronavirus two months before COVID-19. Uh, the COVID-19 outbreak became international news and a few months before it would be declared a pandemic. Uh, the John Hopkins Center for Health and uh, Security summary of the exercise closely resembles, in fact, mirrors exactly 
the actual COVID-19 scenario, including apparent foreknowledge of so-called asymptomatic spread, etc. The CLADEX and Co uh, Event 201 simulations anticipated every aspect of the COVID crisis, notably the responses by governments, health agencies, conventional media, social media, and elements of the public. The simulated responses and their effects included worldwide lockdowns. This is in advance, a simulation, the collapse of businesses and industry, the adoption of biometric surveillance technologies, an emphasis on social media censorship to combat misinformation and disinformation, the flooding of social and legacy media with authoritative sources, widespread riots, remember the summer of love, and mass unemployment. Of course, all of these things took place with the COVID crisis. These premonitory exercises and other COVID curiosities have contributed to the pandemic narrative. Uh, I'm not saying I hold this, but this, I mean, this is out there, this exists, this pandemic narrative, which is speculation that the COVID crisis may have been staged by global elites uh, to, uh, centered around the WEF and the UN as an alibi for instituting the Great Reset. In addition to these exercises just referenced, uh, Swiss policy uh, research points to the WEF's role in promoting digital biometric surveillance identity systems thrusting its young global leaders into major roles uh, in the management of the COVID crisis and the advocating of vac uh, vaccination of children as an entry point for digital identification. Uh, this is all on the agenda of the WEF. Uh, so they had this agenda in advance, then they had these exercises, then COVID happened. So then, in 2019, as I mentioned during the Q&A here, uh, the WF signed a contract or an agreement, a partnership agreement with the uh, UN to advance uh, Agenda 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, the WF promised to finance the UN's climate change agenda. Uh, the framework also commits the WF to helping the UN meet the needs of the fourth industrial revolution, uh, which I'll talk about, but part of that is involves what they're calling digital governance. And this is governmentalities, government, governmentalism that is increasingly outsourced to algorithms, to, uh, to, uh, to AI. Um, and this is government by robots, okay? Uh, Soft bots, though. Maybe some hard bots, too, in the police. They already instituted those in New York. Uh, so then there was the actual forum. Uh, they met the 51st annual meeting at World Economic Forum, delayed and refocused due to the COVID crisis. That was in June of 2020. Then a few months after the, uh, the launch of the Great Reset in June 2020, which was formally announced by now King uh, Charles, by the way, uh, who's a nutcase, but... Uh, then the book came out, the Great Re COVID-19, The Great Reset, and th this led, uh, the timing of this book led this one uh, academic to actually say something of value. He said, although not impossible, the speed at which this book on this particular topic proposing these theses was produced does play into the conspiratorial aesthetic that the book has since induced, even though the authors are transparent about writing and publishing the book within a month's time. This neither confirms the veracity of such claims nor dispels suspicion from those who question its expediency. Academic doublespeak for saying, how the hell did they write this book so quick? After this crisis, uh, that's not the only thing that's fed this conspiratorial aesthetic in the book. Schwab and his co-author say repeatedly what, what an opportunity COVID has presented. Wow, this is just a wonderful, 24 times they refer to COVID as this wonderful opportunity. And there are a few of them. So that's the, the history, the prehistory of all this, uh, except there's a deeper history. It goes back to uh, these roundtable groups that formed 
beginning in 1920, like uh, the Royal Institute of International Affairs, the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, the Bilderberg Group, the Club of Rome, then the World Economic Forum, then the Trilateral Commission. These are all roundtable groups based on Alfred Milner's roundtables. Uh, and uh, this is really where these, these are all globalist organizations that have been pushing a global agenda for uh, over 100 years. So this reset, it, it, it has a, it, it's a, it's a reset of everything. Um, this is just an outline of the kind of things they want to reset. It's a, all, the, all domains of human life, economic, environmental, geopolitical, governmental, industrial, technological, social, and individual. And then the Great Reset, the, the economic system that they want to usher in is called stakeholder capitalism. Now, stakeholder capitalism is a euphemism and doublespeak for this kind of a collusion between the government and the state uh, and the corporate world and uh, this kind of a cartel mon uh, shared monopoly scheme that it establishes uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute uh, so we talked about and somebody's mentioned already some of the strategic partners so this is really where the some people will say, well, the World Economic Forum, they're just a bunch of ineffectual buffoons. What, they don't have any power. They, they can't do anything. These, low, these globalists are just talking. They go to meetings and nothing happens. That's absolutely untrue. Um, they have uh, signed on 1,000 of the world's top corporations in, you know, in all the major sectors of the economy, and they're all firmly behind this agenda. Uh, BlackRock Inc. is uh, one of the major ones. Larry Fink is the CEO. He sits on the, um, uh, the board uh, of trustees of the World Economic Forum, and he is firmly behind the stakeholder capitalism regime, which has as its main mechanism the ESG score. And he declared in 2021 in a letter to CEOs, Climate risk is investment risk. And then he effectively said, uh, we have long believed that our clients as shareholders in your company will benefit if you can create enduring sustainable value for all of your stakeholders. As more and more investors choose to tilt their investments towards sustainability-focused companies, the tectonic shift we are seeing will accelerate further. And because this will have such a dramatic impact on how capital is allocated, every management team and board will need to consider how this will impact their company's stock. Translation, if you don't get on board with the sustainability ESG stakeholder regime, you're going to be starved of capital and die on the vine. That's the translation. And this is merely a translation also of Schwab's own admonitions where he says, uh, Every country from the United States to China must participate, and every industry from oil, gas to tech must be transformed. <laughs> uh, I mean, so we have to make fun of these people. Uh, this is a part of resistance. Uh, and the ESG, as we've already, I've kind of. I'll just sort of fly in there, Schwab's remarks. And there he is, <laughs> likened to Dr. Evil. Uh, and this has been, there was a GM commercial that featured uh, Dr. Evil, and I swear to God they were playing on this Schwab character entirely. Uh, that was at the Super Bowl, not this past one, but the one before. Uh, so I'm going to sort of skim some of this. This is Larry Fink's... Uh, the, uh, this is the assets under management by BlackRock. They held uh, $10 trillion under management. They're the largest asset manager in the world. And this guy is the, it's the tip of the spear driving ESG. So it's not like Schwab is like a quarterback on the field. Okay, He's just executing the plays that are being called down from the booth. And people like, uh, like uh, Larry Fink, they're kind of like the, the, the offensive coordinator. Okay, and then there might be a layer above him who are calling the shots altogether. I'll tell you why. I don't care who they are later. This is the uh, executive order that uh, Biden signed into, uh, that he signed into effect. 
uh, which basically said that climate-related risk is, you know, financial risk. Um, and then he signed another 12 uh, EOs related to these issues. And his first veto was exercised in vetoing the uh, a bill that would take ESG out of uh, investments of pensions. That was his ver first veto in office, which just happened recently. So what is this economic system they want to establish that they call stakeholder capitalism? Uh, I've written about this for Mises Institute. I have a whole series on this, which was the germ of my book. And I thank them for that. Uh, and then I want to say that social, even socialists say that stakeholder capitalism is a form of socialism. This is a socialist who wrote a paper called Toward a Less, should be Toward, okay? There's no word, Towards. Toward a Less Irrelevant Socialism, sharing uh, stakeholding as a reform of the capitalist economy. And uh, so basically in this paper he's arguing that stakeholder capitalism is a form of socialism. It is a kind of socialism. Here's the kind of socialism it is. It is what I call, well, what's been called corporate socialism. Uh, and what is corporate socialism? This is uh, the late, great Anthony C. Anthony C. Sutton, uh, Hoover Institute scholar who wrote about corporate socialism. He said, old J., uh, John D. Rockefeller and his 19th century fe ca fellow capitalists were convinced of one absolute truth that no great monetary wealth could be accumulated under the impartial rules of a competitive laissez-faire society. The only sure road to the acquisition of massive wealth was monopoly. Drive your competitors out of business. Reduce competition. Eliminate laissez-faire. And above all, get state protection for your industry through compliant politicians and government regulation. This avenue yields a legal monopoly, and legal monopoly always leads to wealth. Then he goes on, this robber baron scheme is the socialist plan. The difference between a corporate and state monopoly and a socialist state monopoly is essentially only the identity of the group controlling the power structure. We call this phenomenon of corporate legal monopoly and market control acquired by using political influence by the name of corporate socialism. So that's what you say to people when they say, this isn't socialism, it's being run by a bunch of capitalists. Uh, no, this is being run by a bunch of monopolists. That's why it is socialist. What is socialism if not a monopoly system? These are monopolists who want to monopolize the economy. They use the ESG as a demarcation device in order to drive out all the competition and exclude them from the marketplace and uh, retain complete and total control over the rest of the economy. And it does this to the detriment. Speaking of what it does to small business, it, it's, it's aimed at destroying it. Uh, so it leaves a two-tiered economy, a kind of, uh, well, I also call it this, but it's a kind of uh, actually existing socialism on the ground and a corporate oligarchy on top, or also I've called it capitalism with Chinese characteristics which is a play on the Chinese Communist Party's description of their own economy as socialism with Chinese characteristics, which is a, a piece of rhetorical gymnastics like nothing you've ever heard. Why? Because what it is, is it's, it, was the, it was the CCP's way of rationalizing for-profit production while they maintained a socialist ideological political structure. And uh, so they called it socialism with Chinese characteristics, which is ludicrous. Uh, I call it uh, this system. So what they're doing is they're these globalists, they want to basically establish socialism or capitalism with Chinese characteristics globally. This is my contention. And the Chinese system is the model for the Great Reset. They're looking at China and they go, look, we got, uh, you got all these, you still have for-profit production by these oligarchs. Uh, you have total control over the population. Uh, you have this great surveillance structure, and uh, you know, and you have you still get generated wealth for the for the few, and um, and uh, they've even said this. Uh, for example, uh, Klaus Schwab's mentor, one of his mentors, and one of the mentors is uh, Henry Kissinger, but another one 
is Maurice Strong, who was a, an environmentalist and United Nations undersecretary, former director of the United Nations Environment Program, the first, and the WF, uh, WF board member, foundation board member. He said to The Guardian, we know that capitalism, ha pure capitalism hasn't worked. In China, they have used their system, which they call a socialist market economy, quite well to achieve their objectives. They have learned how to use the methods of capitalism to meet their own goals of socialism. That's what he said. So this is what they want. Uh, they've been modeling China and Schwab recently in an interview with Chinese TV, uh, with official state Chinese TV, said, China's the model for the world. Uh, he effectively said, China make a good model for all nations. Uh, he started speaking Chinese a little bit there. Uh, he, he was kind of like influenced by that environment. You know how it is. Uh, so, you know, one way to understand this is that this is, uh, one of the other things about this is this brings up what he calls, what they call public-private partnerships, which draws these corporations. So here's the very tricky thing. For anti-statists like us, what they're doing is drawing corporations into the state and making them state apparatuses. We see this going on all over the place. You saw it with Twitter. You're seeing it with Google. You, they're, they, these are not private companies per se. They were, first of all, established by InQtel, which is the CIA's own funding agency. Secondly, they operate as state apparatuses and controlling opinion and narratives and uh, and even canceling people from the public sphere. So anyway, but what this represents not only, is not only sort of what leftists will say is the privatization of the government. <gasps> what they, what really is going on here is the governmentalization of private industry, turning private industry into governmental agents. Here's the, rep this represents Incutel and who they funded, for example, uh, of course, they're CIA, they're a CIA operation. They funded Nokia, Microsoft, Oracle, Google, and Facebook, and IBM. Uh, in the case of Google, it was their startup funding. Same with Facebook. Through Greylock partners, but you know, that's how they do things. They try to have some intermediaries, so it's hard to track. So, there's then there's this fourth industrial revolution. Uh, what is this about? Um, I'm just going to cut to the chase. This is high-tech surveillance and control. Uh, they they promise it on. Uh, they promise this like transhumanism, like you'll you'll have complete access to all knowledge of all the world on at the at the tips of your neurons without even going on the web. Uh, you'll have so much power and you'll be able to use AI, it'll be connected to your own brain, you'll become a supercomputer yourself, all this kind of stuff. But it is not really going to be used that way. These are going to be used to control the population at large. Uh, and this technological uh, 4i r really represents like a, a, a dystopic, it's like a dystopic fi uh, science fiction novel. Uh, Basically, uh, the applications include ubiquitous internet, the internet of things, the internet of bodies, autonomous vehicles, smart cities, robots, nanotechnology, digital identity, central bank digital currency, genetic engineering, and so forth. I won't talk about that too much because it's uh, very difficult to get into, but <clears throat> one of the things about this great reset is that it in terms of the social order, what it promises is kind of what they're calling inclusion, but it's inclusion in a shared destiny. Uh, but this inclusion uh, represents the subordination of netizens, which would be us. That's what they call us, netizens. A, a, a total political and economic disenfranchisement and a hypervigilance over the self and others, or what uh, Hannah Arendt uh, called organized loneliness. Uh, and this is really what, and this is great why it's great that we're meeting because this is what they want is organized loneliness. Uh, they even said so during COVID uh, in the uh, 
In the age of COVID, the organized loneliness manifested itself in lockdowns, masking and social distancing and the exclusion of the unvaccinated. The alone together public service announcement produced and circulated by the Ad Council in March of 2020 represented this organized loneliness succinctly. They actually ran an, an ad called Alone Together. Uh, together we're alone, basically. I don't want to make you feel hopeless and helpless and hapless in the face of all this. So I have a nine point plan to stop it. And uh, our pa one of the panelists said basically um, the sort of sentiment of that's behind this. It's, I call this the grand refusal. They want to call it the great reset. By the way, everything great that e has ever been um, proposed by by these kinds of people, like the Great Leap Forward, uh, the Great Purge, uh, the Great Society, they've always been dismal failures. So it's ironic that they would continue to use terms like great with reference to this project. So there's nine points that we should under, uh, the, there's a nine point plan, and it's not, it's, it's a kind of a principle, sense of principles. The main premise of the nine point plan is that we need to cut the global puppet strings from ourselves. We cannot control necessarily what these people try to do, but we can, can, we can cut the strings from our, our bodies and minds. And that's the premise. So the nine point plan includes refusing the CBDC because it is the closing of the totalitarian circle. If you have to beg, borrow and steal and trade and barter and use other currency to avoid the CBDC, do so. Refuse the internet of bodies where they're going to try to install technology on your body and in your body as a way of monitoring your organs and organ systems. Sounds crazy. It's all on the table. Re refuse digital identity, which is a, <clears throat> this is basically a database that will follow you from cradle to grave, not exactly for all of us, but the idea is a complete record of all of your activities, including vaccination status, probably a political profile, et cetera. Digital identity is a disaster and must refuse it. Inclusion, they'll sell it under the terms inclusion, but inclusion means totalitarianism. When there's no outside of a system, that's totalitarianism. So uh, that's what they are. And then, of course, we have to practice the free market in all our affairs. And that is to say, we must keep the free market alive. Somebody mentioned remnant, I think it was Alan. I think that may be all we are as a remnant. We may not be able to reverse the global agenda ourselves, but we can remain a remnant that will push, put, that will pass on to the future a legacy of individual freedom and the f principles of the free market and self-determination. That's the very least we can do. We can do better, but that's the very least we, we must do. Uh, then, of course, divest from any ESG stocks electronically in their, uh, in their asset managers. Uh, remove money from ESG reporting banks. And that includes, like Bank of America, Brian Moynihan is a major uh, pusher of this ESG stakeholder regime. So check out and see if your bank is actually participating in this, and they probably are. Uh, and there, we need to make a, 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 a we need to make a tectonic shift in the other direction, taking our money away from this beast, because it is a monopoly scheme that's meant to crush uh, and destroy uh, large segments of the uh, economy and uh, well-being. Uh, and then, you know, legislation. Well, we saw the first attempt at legislation to curb ESG stricken, struck down by Biden. So it's, it's very difficult to, uh, I don't put much uh, hope in um, legislators to do anything. And unfortunately, they're very much infiltrated. Uh, and, uh, but uh, we can still pressure them to divest. For example, we fund the World Economic Forum. The United States funds it. I mean, this is just unbelievable. This has to stop. Uh, and I would say, to go further, we should stop funding the UN and the World uh, Health Organization as well. Uh, 
Um, and, you know, encourage them, like these 19 states that signed a letter to Larry Fink saying we're not going along with this, and other states are pulling out, like Florida will not go into ESG indexing for their pensions. We need to put pressure on legislators to get pensions and other funds out of the ESG index market uh, and away from those asset managers. It's so easy to identify who, you know, the marks are all over the beast. Uh, and I think we also need to encourage defection from uh, the elite. There are some possible elite defectors. I don't know about the status of Elon Musk. He's an ambiguous figure in my mind. But I like to keep hope alive that he may actually represent some possibility, at least in getting uh, some victories. Uh, he does operate this company, Neuralink, which is really uh, brain cloud interfacing, effectively. It could be brain cloud interfacing. That means your brain will be on the web. Uh, but he's also sort of uh, like-minded about ESG. He called it a scam. And uh, he is also uh, at least nominally in favor of free to free speech. So we'll see. But in any case, there have to be other elites out there, too, who might defect from this insanity uh, because it will be a disaster. Uh, I go into the, in the book the agricultural disaster. It represents the kind of famine it could actually uh, uh, produce and so on and so forth. So. Check that out. But all, the, all in all, I'm calling these steps part of the grand refusal. And this is my iconic character to represent the grand refusal. Some of you will recognize the, uh, this figure, Har Howard Beale, uh, from the movie Network. Uh, although he delivered his message through the television, this newscaster gone rogue encouraged his viewers to turn off their televisions, to thrust open their windows, and to scream, I'm mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. And although his viewers were framed uh, by their rectangular boxes of, the, of, of their windows, which resembled TVs, and thus replicated the TV itself, Beale's individual and collective viewers nevertheless issued a clarion call to each other and to the elites. And I think we need to issue a clarion call. We are not going to take this anymore. This isn't a call, this is not a call for revolution. This is a call for counter-revolution against these revolutionary uh, subversive elites that are wrecking our society. And altogether, these what I call subversive elites who have nothing but the subversion of the social body in their, in their, as their objective. So, uh, I, I would just leave it at that. This isn't a drill. Uh, we're not trying to achieve another utopia. We have realistic ideas. We, want, we don't look for perfection. We look for sanity, and we look for the continuity of our species. So we are not insane, but they're going to call us that. They're going to call us everything in the book. But we must not allow the, the elite and their minions to deter us with such epithets. We have a world to save. Thank you.